It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mary Alice McCarthy. Uh, Mary Alice is the director of the Center on Education and Skills at the New America Foundation. Her work examines the intersection between higher education, workforce development, and job training policies. Prior to joining New America, she worked at both the U.S. Departments of Education and Labor, where she led a variety of technical assistance initiatives in the areas of career pathways, credentialing, and competency-based education. Our panelists will include David Miyashiro, who is the superintendent of the Cajon Valley Union School District in San Diego, California. The district serves a diverse community of 17,000 students across 27 schools. David's team has created a comprehensive K-12 curriculum called The World of Work and gained national attention on innovations in education. Next, we'll have Jim Van Kuhlenberg. Uh, he's the training coordinator for Optimax Systems, an Ontario, New York-based optics manufacturing company where he has worked for over 25 years. Jim dedicates much of his free time to teaching the next generation about optics, both internally at Optimax and in the community at a local high school and community college. And then finally, Michael Sorrell. Uh, he is in his 14th year serving as the president of Paul Quinn College. Under his leadership, Paul Quinn College has become one of the 10 most innovative colleges and universities in America. He and his wife, Natalie, live in Dallas and have two children, Michael Augustus and Sage Louise Sinclair. So uh, before I turn it over to Mount Mary Alice uh, to start the panel, we'll take a look at the uh, poll, and it looks like the score of 4.1, that is an increase over the start of the panel, so uh, very pleased about that. So um, thanks for doing the poll and uh, sticking with us, and I'll turn it over now to Mary Alice. Great. Thank you, PJ. Uh, hello, everyone. Can folks hear me? Just to make sure I'm doing okay. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, PJ, and thank you to the Federal Reserve Board for the opportunity to be here with you today uh, and talk about innovations in financing post-secondary education and training. Um, my name is Mary Alice McCarthy, and I direct the Center on Education and Labor at New America. And I just want to say congratulations to Paul and to Cheyenne and Ethan. That was an excellent panel, and I certainly learned a lot. Um, and I know we're going to have a great panel uh, to follow up on that. So that discussion was focused on the very specific financing model, income share agreements, uh, and how and how those the, sort of the pros and cons. We're now going to sort of pull back a little bit and focus on some different approaches that really um, get at how to help students make good decisions in this uh, post-secondary education marketplace that they're entering, how to help students find affordable options uh, that can get their education actually paid for, and how to also help students get good, relevant experience while they're in school to help facilitate those transitions from school into, the, into, into work. Um, so as I said, we have an excellent panel for you today. Before we di dive into the conversations with the presenters, though, I would like to take just a minute to do a little bit of table setting on why these strategies are so important right now, and also why they're sometimes so difficult to implement, and why these are, are why what we're hearing about are such tremendously innovative models. Um, so I think first and foremost, it's just very important to anchor this conversation that we're having in the fact that adults with some formal post-secondary education, whether it's a college degree or an apprenticeship certificate, but these adults with post-secondary education enjoy significantly higher levels of economic security than adults with no post-secondary education. That came up at the very beginning of the, the, the kickoff of, of today's panel. And I just think we simply can't overstate it. This is a long-standing trend, but it's one that becomes particularly, it's put into particularly sharp relief during recession, such as the one we're in right now. Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience that, you know, the, the unemployment rate for um, uh, adults with a high school diploma or less is over 7%. For people with a bachelor's degree or more, it's under 4%. So the differences in labor market experiences and economic security and economic mobility by educational attainment are, are strong and growing stronger every day. Um, um, and um, the stakes of getting some education after high school have never been higher, and they only continue to grow. Um, but we also know that despite these very high stakes and a lot of attention, for a whole lot of reasons, many young people and adults enroll in college and never finish. And many others struggle with the transition out of high school or out of college and into actual jobs and careers. Indeed, many young people spend considerable time kind of wandering around after they leave high school or college, sort of wandering out there in the wilderness, not quite sure what to do or how to find their way. And those rocky transitions are really costly for individuals, and they're also costly for all of us, because these are folks who are not using their full potential when they could be. 
And I think it's important to understand why in the United States um, this is particularly prevalent. We see it much more than we see in other countries, particularly European countries. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the way we've organized our education and training systems in the United, United States sometimes makes it particularly hard for young people to make good, informed choices about their future. Right? There's three features very quickly that I just want to that I just want to touch on that we're going to hear a lot more about in today's from today's presenters, but that I think are really important for us to grapple with when we think about good strategies and good policy. The first is that as a society and as a country, we place tremendous, a tremendous amount of importance and emphasis on individual choice. We want young people to choose their own path. We want them to have every choice available to them. And we do indeed give them a lot, a lot, a lot of choices, right? Um, and that's great, and that's very much who we are. Um, but it does mean that making sure young people can make good choices is critically important. Um, and that brings us to a second really important feature of our education and training systems, both at the K-12 level and the post-secondary level, is that historically, these systems emphasize academic learning over other forms of experiential or vocational or hands-on learning. Young people in the United States are really encouraged to focus on their studies, and academic performance is generally what gets you from high school to college, not whether, not how much you know uh, about particular jobs or careers. Right? Um, and so what that means is that a lot of young people are making critical decisions about their future, what to study and for which career, without much in the way of experience. And as we all know, we all make better decisions when we've had some experience or some exposure. And that brings us to the third piece, which I don't want to belabor because it was also came up in, in the previous discussion and at the very beginning of the, of the webinar, which is that the cost of higher education is increasing every year. And increasingly, we expect students and their families to finance their college education by taking on debt as they need to. And while there's little question that for students who finish their degrees, the debt will likely have been worth it, many students never do complete their degree. In part, they never complete their degree because they didn't make a good decision on the front end about what to study. Right? So we've got a very high risk system that is built on choice, individual choice, and young people and adults need to make very good decisions. So what can we do to reduce that risk? How can we help young people and adults make good informed choices so that they don't end up dropping out of college with, yeah, dropping out with some college, no degree or a bunch of debt? How do we help them find those affordable options like apprenticeship? We actually pay them to learn and we'll be hearing more about that in a minute. So I'm going to, with that, then um, start us off with, um, at, at, with a really exciting presentation from David Miyashiro of uh, the Cajon, um, Valley, pardon me, I don't, I apologize, who is the superintendent of the Cajon Valley Union School District in California, and we're going to start with K, with the K-12 system. Thank you, Mary Alice. And, yeah, and PJ and Federal Reserve Board, where, you know, a, a nicer way of saying it is this is all your fault that we're having this conversation, because the flaws in the K-12 system will ultimately result themselves in the economy. And so I'm going to start my timer and, and play for eight minutes, and I'm just going to share a little bit about our district and jump into the solution because I think Ethan talked about our work with the San Diego Workforce Partnership. You're going to see a lot of influence from them uh, in this work. And then also California, you're generous in saying California made a wrong decision, but California is the fifth largest economy and the first largest bureaucracy, and we're not shy about saying that either. So if, if possible here, it's possible anywhere. But our district, uh, our vision is to have happy kids engaged in healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment with a vision of the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family in our community. And the journey began eight years ago for us when we provided every child with modern technology, ubiquitous Wi-Fi, and access to technology in their home. And then recently we've uh, migrated to a, a single sign-on and a very seamless integration, moving from a a teacher-driven system to a learner-driven system where we can have children explore their strengths, interests, and values in the classroom in real time. We didn't provide children with laptops for distance learning, which ended up helping us eventually, but that wasn't the intent. And so this is what learning looks like in the classroom. Our teachers are working with data and students in small groups and individual children, uh, personalizing their learning. And then when we had to transition to distance learning in March last year, it was a fairly seamless transition for us. And here are a couple of videos that I'm not gonna play because of the, the media lag, 
but really our kids were able to transition from March 13th when we shut down to March 16th up and running in their homes because they've been using these tools in the classroom already. One of the things I will share is in relation to the economy, we were the first school district in the country to open. In April, right after the stay at home orders went into place, our parents reached out and said, you know what, both of us are essential workers and we have to go to work. We don't have any, any choice for our children. And so we opened up our schools for free childcare for essential workers. And while the kids were there, we just ran school. And then we opened up our classrooms to summer learning and enrichment for those parents that felt safe enough to bring back. And I'll just play a little bit of testimony from Leilani, one of our eighth graders back in July. I think the best thing um, of coming back here was that we all get to see each other again. It's been a very long time since we've seen each other and that while we're doing it, we are safe. With the start of school closure, we took it very seriously. We went nowhere for a solid three months. Having the opportunity where we can send our children back to an environment that they're familiar with, they had it. And I just stopped there. Our parents were largely appreciative, but we saw ourselves in an essential function of the economy, in addition to be a place of education. And so all of our kids came back to school in September. And here's where our board meets. Our vision is happy kids and healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. We know in order to do that, we have to close the gap between education and the world of work. And that's what we've done with the San Diego Workforce Partnership and our Regional Economic Development Council is change the trajectory of the school system to help every child find gainful employment. And it's not enough to help and serve families in poverty. Our job is to help them get out of poverty. And in order to do that, we go back to our founding fathers that there are two educations. One should teach you how to make a living and the other how to live. And that's where our mission and vision came from. Here's a short clip of our mayor talking about our community world of work program. The Cajon Valley School District is doing amazing things. This is not just innovative from a San Diego County perspective. This is an innovative from a world perspective. Uh, there can be a large disconnect between the actual workplace environment and what uh, you're learning, learning in school. All right, children, are you ready to go on an adventure with me? And today, we're going to go on an adventure to tell you all about costuming in theater. It's not every day that we do so much live discussion and conversation. The full video is on our district YouTube channel, but basically the, the community and the world of work is the curriculum for the children and their learning. Uh, I have to give credit for our school board who pioneered this effort. effort. We invested $3 million into the development of this curriculum around these goals. And so these are happy kids and healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. We measure this with Gallup, measures engagement, hope, career, and financial literacy, not just standardized tests for academia. And we found that the results are our game changer. Social emotional well-being is directly tied to hope for my future and tools to navigate it. And so the hard skills on the right side that we talked a little bit about in the income sharing agreements, those are going to change over time. The soft skills won't. And so our curriculum is built around computer science, uh, re relationship skills, presentation literacy in the world of work. And then here's a couple of our students, Jose, gave a speech right before the pandemic at San Diego State University using his presentation literacy skills. This is actually a video that I'm not going to play. Uh, and it was born from our annual event, TEDx Kids at El Cajon, where we celebrate the best ideas. All kids learn presentation skills. All kids learn how to take an idea and turn it into performance. But some ideas uh, eventually wind up on our grand stage, which is an annual event. These kids, uh, TED Talks wind up on the TED YouTube channel. And what a great resume booster, right? For a seventh grader to say, watch my TED Talk that I gave when I was in third grade. I'm gonna play you a piece of Rukeyes. Uh, she's one of our uh, 42 languages spoken here from the Middle East. Do you shower with that on? Do you have hair under there? Are you bald? These are the type of questions I get when I'm wearing my hijab. Imagine every time you leave your house, you know you have to be ready to expect hateful and cruel comments thrown at you. Hey there, I, Rakea. I'm an ordinary young girl living life. I am full of dreams that will hopefully become true. I'm a hijabi. 
That means a girl with a scarf on her head. Our career development starts with self-awareness. Max gave a talk about uh, Tourette syndrome, which he's, he's struggling through right now as a fourth grader. AP has spent several of her first years of uh, education in a refugee camp in Su Sudan before coming to the United States. And Precious is a high school student who's well on her path to gainful employment. This is called presentation literacy. It's a part of our curriculum that builds self-awareness around their career and academic journey, and also their own personal strengths and interests and values, and how they align to the world of work. We built this into a comprehensive framework that's scalable and shareable uh, across the country. Their career explorations that build on social emotional development, SEL will help you get a job and will get you fired if you don't have those skills. The Federal Office of Student Aid saw this work early on and asked us to build in tools for FSAID and FAFSA completion into K-12 so that kids know what they're doing before they take out any type of post-secondary financing, including in income sharing agreements. And so we drill down in K-2, it starts really easy. What's a goal and how do I decide what to buy? But ultimately, uh, it manifests themselves in FAFSA completion and looking at the college scorecard to see what's available. When COVID happened, we had to build a, a system to push it out to kids in their homes. And so we partnered with Beable to build our world of work experiences where kids explore, simulate, meet a professional and practice in their classroom in their home. All while looking at the students reading ability, their career development and their interest, how they shape over time as they explore a variety of careers. And then I'll finish with some of the, the tools that our teachers and parents have to see the development of their children. A report card when you were in school probably didn't look like this, your interest, your career aspirations, and how your academic progress aligns with those goals. And teachers probably didn't have tools like this to see that type of, of 360 uh, viewpoint of their students. But this is the work we're doing with the Department of uh, Finance and Department of Education. We built it in now to a comprehensive curriculum that pe teachers, parents, and students complete together looking at the cost of post-secondary education, the, the types of decisions they can make. And we've turned all of our library spaces with the help of the San Diego Workforce Partnership into launch pads, career development centers, exploring the regional chamber of commerce and the opportunities right here in El Cajon, but also the greater San Diego area with uh, the priority sectors with the Workforce Partnership. These are our curriculums. This is our vision and mission. And I look forward to the, the panel for sharing. Thank you for letting me share. Great, thank you, David. Uh, thank you for that excellent and inspiring uh, set of videos. Um, that was that was great. And so let's move up um, up the educational spectrum a little bit from um, sort of our K twelve system, a little bit more into sort of our high school and 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 uh, early post secondary. And I'm going to pass it over to Jim Van Clu uh, um, Jim Van Cohenberg. Um, Jim is joining us from upstate New York and, and is also joining us from outside of the education system, from the business community. So Jim, you spend your time sort of reaching into high schools and community colleges, trying to help young people find their pathway into the very high quality apprenticeships that you offer at Optimax. So can you tell us a little bit about what Optimax does, your, your apprenticeship programs, and what it's also like to work with the high schools and community colleges in your area? Sure, I can. Thank you, Mary Alice. Um, I'm really excited about the work that David's doing. If we could get some of that in New York State, that would be pretty awesome. Um, Megan, can we go to the next slide? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I wanted to thank PJ and the Federal Reserve for having us here today. Uh, my name is Jim Van Kallenberg, and I work for Optimax Systems. We're a, an advanced manufacturing company in uh, Ro near Rochester, New York. We, we manufacture precision optics. We have a workforce of about 350 employees. Um, a recent example of our work is on the Mars rover Perseverance, uh, which landed on Mars last month, and we made the lenses that are in five of the cameras on that mission. Um, we also provide optics for a wide variety of industry sectors, from uh, medical to aerospace, defense, semiconductor, entertainment. There's there's a lot of optics that are everywhere. Um, and one of the things that we've been involved in for a long time is providing work experience for young people. Um, we think that it's critical for students to explore career paths at a young age so that they can make informed decisions about their post-secondary development, which is 
kind of great to see what David's doing and along those along those lines. So today I want to share some of the things that are working well for us and some areas where we could probably use a little help. Um, I want to talk about apprenticeship as post-secondary education, the importance of career exploration, and the value of youth apprenticeship programs. Uh, next slide. So uh, it's important that students are made aware that registered apprenticeship is a really high quality post-secondary education. Uh, it includes structured on the job training and related technical instruction. Apprentices learn the mechanics of the role on the job from skilled journey workers and the technical aspects are taught in the classroom setting and that can usually be in a community college, trade school, or some sort of online resource. And another important thing to note here is the employer covers the cost of the related instruction. Uh, the United States Department of Labor lists over 1,200 apprenticeable occupations. Um, in 2016, we created our own apprenticeship. Uh, we offer a, a three-year program in the, the trade of precision optics manufacturing technician. Um, our apprentices are full-time employees. Uh, they fill a productive role for the company while they learn the trade from experts in the field. Our apprentices rotate through every aspect of the company and they get a strong understanding of all aspects from sales to shipping. Since we focus mostly on optics manufacturing, the majority of the three years is spent on the manufacturing floor. Wages increase on a regular basis as the apprentice can create more value. In most apprenticeships, the starting wage is substantially lower than that of a journey worker and increases incrementally as they progress through the program ending up at a journey worker rate when they receive their papers. In, in a registered apprenticeship like ours, the journey worker certificate is a portable, nationally recognized credential in their field. I looked through a bunch of different websites and I found a lot of uh, information comparing the lifetime workers, uh, the lifetime earnings of workers completing apprenticeship and they show that to be on par or slightly ahead of those completing a four-year degree, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, part of that is because the apprentices, the apprentice has the advantage of earning uh, from day one, and they usually end up with no student loan debt to repay. Um, so over the lifetime, uh, it can actually put them ahead of a bachelor's degree holder. And these are, you know, these are websites like Wisconsin's. Uh, uh, Department of Workforce Development, uh, you know, several several different state websites that, that showed these kind of graphs. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> so uh, we, David was talking about career exploration in his schools. Uh, we do a lot of career exploration in our region. Um, we're, we're committed to providing students with career exploration opportunities. Uh, it's critical for students to understand what their future career might look and feel like. Career exploration begins with facility tours. In a normal year, we would conduct 50 to 60 tours for groups of students and educators everywhere from pre-K through college. Um, our tours provide a view of the products we make, our processes, and our work environment. We also make presentations in 25 to 30 high schools and middle schools every year. Um, this past year was a little bit different and being unable to host tours or, or present in the schools, uh, we ended up creating a virtual tour. Um, and we've been presenting that, in fact, we presented it this morning. <laughs> and uh, so we, we've been presenting that in a lot of schools and this has really expanded our reach. Uh, we've gotten beyond the 25 and 30 normal schools that we would present at in our, in our uh, immediate region and expanded out to about a nine county region that we're presenting to. Um, and, you know, all these presentations, some of these students see us as a place that are very interesting. This is really cool. I'd like to do that. And then there's other students that are like, no way. This is nothing I'm ever going to do. And we, we look at both of those as a win. Um, students are, are starting uh, to make the informed decisions about what, they're, what interests them. The next step in our career exploration is, would be a job shadow. A uh, student spends four to eight hours shadowing an employee in some area that interests them, and we do job shadows and throughout the company. We've done it, uh, manufacturing, marketing, finance, HR, maintenance, a lot of different areas. And from there, if the student's interested, the next step is a paid internship or co-op. In a, a normal year, uh, we have 30 to 40 interns with co-ops working in our facility. And these could be high school students that are enrolled in a CTE program uh, or college students in a, in a variety of disciplines. 
We offer six week paid internships to high school students uh, during the summer between their junior and senior year or immediately after graduation. College co-ops are usually project based and support the student's major. Um, often our college co-ops return for multiple projects and many become long-term employees. Uh, several members of our management team uh, started at Optimax as, as co-ops. Um, another program that I want to throw in here, uh, which is a little bit different, is uh, our Exploring Post. We have an Exploring Post. Exploring is a branch of Boy Scouts of America, if you're not familiar with them. Um, it's open to young men and women ages 15 to 20. And in our program, we typically take a cohort of about 10 to 12 students all the way through the design and manufacture of some type of optical system. We've made VR headsets, we've made telescopes, we, we let the students pick what they'd like to make and then we figure out how to make it. Um, we provide a hands-on understanding of the math that's required to design the lens system and, and then we take them through the manufacturing process to, to actually make the lenses. Uh, we finish by putting that together and create something that the explorer can take home that, they, that they've actually made. Um, Exploring is really underdeveloped in advanced manufacturing, and this is one area where we'd like to see more employers get involved because, again, it gives the students those strong career exploration opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I've, I've talked about uh, some of the aspects of our career exploration. Uh, this is how we tie them together for our high school recruiting program. Um, we, we uh, bring many of these things together and we're trying to get interested students to become full-time team members. We start with our school presentations. Uh, from there, interested students are invited to bring their parents to an open house at Optimax. They get a tour, they learn more about the careers that we offer. After that, students that are, that are interested uh, are invited to attend an orientation. And this is basically a three-day job shadow uh, that we, we do during one of the school breaks now. We had a problem with that in 2020. We got our February one in, but we weren't able to do the one in April. Um, the orientation gives us an opportunity to gauge the student's interest and aptitude, and it also gives the student a chance to see if this is something they would like to pursue. Interested students at the end of that are then offered a six-week paid internship over the summer. Successful internships can lead to full-time job offers if the students have graduated or co-ops during their senior year. Uh, we started this back in 2017, and we've got several full-time team members and uh, at least one apprentice that have come through that process. Uh, obviously, in 2020, it got a little squirrely, that stuff went away, and uh, students weren't in school, and we weren't able to have non-essential visitors in our facility. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, so fortunately, in 2019, Monroe Community College and the Rochester Technology and Manufacturing Association received a grant to create the Finger Lakes, Work, Finger Lakes Youth Apprenticeship Program. Um, and their mission is to match students in CTE programs with manufacturers for job shadows, co-ops, internships, and ideally uh, full-time uh, positions and apprenticeships. Um, in their first year, they placed about 35 students with potential employers. Uh, even during COVID, they were able to recruit, vet, and match 34 students with manufacturing companies. And fortunately, we were able to we were able to sign five of their candidates uh, to come into Optimax and hopefully eventually end up in our apprenticeship program. Um, some of the benefits of youth apprenticeship is if the student is doing work that applies to a registered apprenticeship, whether it's on the job or in the classroom they can receive retroactive credit toward their apprenticeship when they register with the sponsor. Um, let's go to the next slide. And this is, a, this is a new concept in New York State. The youth apprenticeship really isn't recognized here, um, but it's, it's well established in several other states. Idaho, North Carolina, Wisconsin all have strong youth apprenticeship programs. Um, our goal is to create a critical mass in our region uh, that's going to force New York to get in line with some of these uh, best practice states to uh, to recognize youth apprenticeship. Um, we see the Finger Lakes Youth Apprenticeship Program as a, as the ongoing expansion of what we started with our recruiting program, uh, just with a little more uh, a little more muscle, and they're able to bring more more students and more employers to the table than we were able to do on our own. Um, 
So one of the one of the challenges that I see at the national level is is how can we share best practices between states? How can we take advantage of the work that's being done in Idaho and Wisconsin uh, to bring New York and other states up to speed? So next slide. Um, career and tech education. In New York, we have both these pro centers or Board of Cooperative Educational Services. They offer a wide range of career training opportunities. In other states, these are referred to as different things, CESAs, technical high schools, whatever. Um, but these schools offer great hands-on vocational training uh, and a lot of dual enrollment opportunities with the community colleges. We work closely with the five BOCES centers in our region, but often we find that these programs are, are under-enrolled. And if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> In our conversations with some of the school administrators and school board members, we've learned that some of these enrollment challenges um, are due to the cost to the component school district to send their students to the, to the BOCE Center. Um, this is something that, where again, where we'd like to figure out how we can uh, help defray some of these costs uh, so that we can encourage more students to take advantage of these, uh, of these resources. Because these are really good career exploration uh, opportunities. So let's see, um, can we go to the next slide, yep. And just one last thing I wanna throw in, uh, when we bring these students in, we, we don't intend for them to end their education. Uh, we, we provide 100% tuition assistance for all our employees to continue their education. In just about every industry, um, lifelong learning is critical. Every, all the technologies in every industry are advancing so rapidly that if, if you're not learning, you're, you're, you're falling behind. Um, so we encourage our team members to continue their, their education. Uh, an employee doesn't have to pay taxes on tuition benefits up to $5,250, and the employer gets a tax credit up to that amount. So we feel more employers should be offering this kind of uh, education incentive. And we're, again, we're curious about how we might be able to influence that. And I think one more slide. And that's pretty much what I've got. Um, Thanks for, for inviting me today, and I'll turn this back to Mary Ellis, and I'll be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jim. That was great, and such a great program at Optimax, and, and there's already some questions lining up in the queue. So, um, But next, we're going to turn to Michael Sorrell, who is the president of Paul Quinn College. Paul Quinn College is a one of a, a handful of work colleges. This is an urban work college in the country, and we're going to hear about how that model works. So, President Sorrell, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Megan. I appreciate it. It is wonderful to be here with everyone today. Uh, I am particularly excited to have an opportunity to share with you our model, but I'm also very, very excited, um, Mary Alice, about us talking and learning from everyone else and, and what they're doing. Um, so I thought I would start off with just giving you some context in terms of why this program was so important for us to create. 85% um, of our students are Pell Grant students which means that 85% of our students come from the lowest socioeconomic strata in America. These are people whose lives are defined by scarcity and by the inability to do simple things simply. And when that is your experience, it creates a plethora of deficits that need to be addressed. Some are relationship capital deficits, some are learning deficits, but all of them in one way, shape or form have been compounded by the fact that this has been your reality for a sustained period of time. So when our students arrive at our doors, they are eager to learn, they are eager to achieve, but there is foundational work that must be done in order for them to be successful. As we watched and monitored their performance as we went forward, we began to notice that upon graduation, many of our students weren't able to attract the type of employment that we felt was would be transformational for them. And we went to employers and we asked, well, why aren't you hiring our students? And many of them were very candid. So well, they're just not ready. They don't have the emotional intelligence. They don't have the relationship intelligence. They, they just aren't competitive in the marketplace that we participate in. Now that was particularly hurtful, right? I mean, that's not what you wanna hear, but it is incredibly important to hear the truth. 
And right about that time, we were also an institution that was struggling with what would our path forward be. Uh, when I arrived 14 years ago, we were a very, very struggling institution. We were given 18 to 24 months of ex to even survive and exist. Um, we had a 1% graduation rate, um, which is just something every time I say it, I struggle to understand how that's even possible. Uh, but we were an institution that needed a different path. Um, then we realized that our students were averaging around $40,000 in student loan debt. And that was primarily because they had to, they stayed in school much longer than the average rate, right? So when you're coming from a Pell Grant background where everything to pay for school is either Pell Grant or student loans, and it's taking you an extended period of time to graduate, all that adds up. And so we took a look at all of this and we were trying to figure out what would we do and we caught a break. Um, I, traveled to Detroit, we were changing our recruiting model. We were going to places where we had a competitive advantage to borrow Michael Porter's uh, terminology. And we asked ourselves, what's really our competitive advantage? And we came to the conclusion at that point in time, being in Dallas was our competitive advantage. We had a great economy and the weather was warm. So we thought about where would this be advantageous? Where would this message be well received? Cities and states where the economies are struggling and cold weather places. So one of the easiest targets during that period was Detroit. Uh, so I traveled to Detroit and was meeting with the public schools there and trying to get a deal done. And it wasn't really working out well. And I became frustrated after several trips and just told my office before I left that day for the airport, just find me a Catholic school, All right? Just find me a Catholic school to go talk to. Uh, in part because I went to Catholic schools. I understand the language, I understand the people, I understand the values. They sent me to Detroit Crystal Ray. And Detroit Crystal Ray is one of the work high schools in the Crystal Ray network. And Michael Corey, who is the president there, walked me through the model. And it was literally as if the heavens opened up, a light shined down on my head, and I said, well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't this model work at the college level? And he said, well, it does. They're the work college. I said, yeah, but all those schools are in rural areas. Why wouldn't an urban model of this work? He said, no one's ever tried it. Bingo. We came, I came back, we did the research, we presented it to our board, and we hatched the plan of becoming a new model of the work college. And one of the things that caused us to embrace this was that we knew it would give us a chance to focus on getting internships for our students which would then allow them to develop the way they needed to develop to be able to attract these, these jobs. We presented it to the students and we said, look, I think I can get your student loan debt down. And we think that we can make you more competitive in the marketplace if you are willing to change your relationship with the institution and help us run the institution. The students agreed. And we're going to fast forward a little bit, and here's what's happened since that time, or here's what it became. We became, we created the model where students work an average of 15 hours a week, either on campus or off campus, in corporate internships that we go out and secure. The students are, the, we reduced the cost of attendance, um, which allowed us to attack the student loan issue. Um, and early on, we'll just walk through it very easily, we took the Pell Grant amount, right? So this is how students pay for school now. Your Pell Grant pays 6,300 and we charge about $16,500 for everything, right? So that's room, board, tuition fees, everything, because we don't think people should pay for college for the rest of their lives, right? And if you subtract the 6,300 from student loan debt, then you're down to 10,200, right? Each student gets a $5,000 base scholarship for participating in the work program. That's another 5,000. That 5,000 reduces your loan debt to about $4,800, right? Or the unmet needs of $4,800. Then every student picks up an average of 1,500 in additional institutional aid or SEOG funds, which is another federal program. Right. 
that reduces it down to $3,300. Now, at that point, you have a couple of choices. You can either borrow the money, which gives you, even if you borrow it every year, you're still down to under $15,000 in student loan debt, which is what we reduce the average student loan debt to. Um, or you can also, if you participate in one of the uh, $15,000 internships that people pay, you can pay that off yourself with some of the additional money. So you pay an additional $3,300. Now you had an $8,000 scholarship. The rest of the $7,000 is spending money for you to have, which keeps you from then having to take out or go get a third or a second job, uh, which then allows you to focus more time on your studies, allows you to graduate either on time or early. What we have seen since the, the addition to this program, our retention rates have gone up. Uh, the student loan, as I mentioned, student loan debt went way down. But what's really more interesting to me is the types of employment opportunities that we are seeing our students get. One of our, our actually our largest partner is J.P. Morgan Chase, and J.P. Morgan Chase has hired every year they've hired multiple students from the program. Right, that that wasn't happening prior to this. We've sent students to go work at private equity firms. That wasn't happening. Uh, students are going to work at Verizon uh, in management training programs. Our students' futures have been radically changed because of internships that they have every semester. So you come to Paul Quinn College, you're going to graduate with three forms of education under your belt. The first is your subject matter expertise, which is whatever you decide to major in. The second is the experiential learning expertise that you picked up as a result of being a part of this work program. The last part is our credentialing program where every year students have the opportunity to earn some type of digital credential that they, they can then use to market themselves going forward. So when you take a step back and you look at all of this and you ask, is this program successful? I think you have to answer absolutely because what's our stated goal? One, to better prepare our students for better employment opportunities, check. To reduce the student loan debt, check. To make sure that they are emotionally experienced and that we've stood in the gap and helped their relationship capital be developed, check. But also our graduation rate is right now with this current cohort projected to be 40%. So we have gone from 1% to 40%, and an enormous part of that is the work program. So um, I believe in giving people back time and not going on until people's eyes roll back in their head and don't want to hear me anymore. But what I will say quite simply is this. It is really, really important that we understand why people come to college. They come to college to get a career to have gainful employment. Most students do not have the luxury of just coming to college to learn. We romanticize that notion. People who went to schools like I did, I went to Oberlin for undergrad, Duke for graduate school and law school, Penn for my doctorate. Those are families many times that have the luxury of talking about lifelong learning. I'm an enormous proponent of lifelong learning. I'm just a bigger proponent of lifelong earning. And our students, who are coming out of these backgrounds need to know that they're entering schools that understand the language that they speak. They understand how important it is. And one other thing that I, I would really like to add is we have to understand who's coming to school now. America's K-12 educational system is now defined by poverty. The majority of students are coming from low-income backgrounds. Students who are coming from low-income backgrounds are going to be Pell Grant students in college. So all these institutions that think it's okay to educate five, six, seven, eight, ten percent of their student body being Pell Grant students, when the majority of students or close to the majority of students in public schools in their states are coming from low-income backgrounds, A, I would argue that's unacceptable. B, I would tell you that those students 
need a special set of considerations. We already know 75 plus percent of all college students are working 20 hours per week or more. So if that's the case, if we also know that over 85% of employers expect first year students to come to them or entry level jobs to come to them with work experience, we know that over 50% of all students wish college had given them more real world work experience. And these are the numbers before we get to the majority of students coming out of low income families. Then I submit to you, perhaps it's time for all of higher education to rethink its model and become more student centered. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent and, and wow, really deeply impressive work that you're doing there uh, in Dallas. Um, it's really exciting. And uh, again, I think we've just heard three amazing presentations about how to narrow that sort of chasm between schools and the world of work. Uh, students are already in both places a lot of times already at once, but often, uh, ironically, our, our education system is not, and uh, and those barriers are a real problem for, for students. So we're gonna go, we've already got some great questions that have lined up in the, um, in the chat here, so I'm going to going to sort of throw some of those out and, and David start with you. Um, so we do have a question for you that says, David, when, when you talk to other super superintendents, what do they say about the challenges they face in modeling what Cajon Valley is doing? And I'm going to add on that to that too, is, is I recall too, you had done some like pretty serious tracking and evaluating of your um, efforts. And I'm wondering if you might share a little bit of that as well when you talk about this. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, we do have data around the efficacy of our programs. And we're measuring through Gallup, hope and engagement and financial uh, empowerment, but also uh, vividness, vividness around a hope for possible selves with specific career goals. And vocational psychology that this is grounded in shows that kids that have a, a, a hope for possible selves and believe they have the tools and the ability to get there are going to stay much more engaged in school. And so our superintendents, they all want the same outcomes for their kids. But until the federal and state governments start measuring these things, like vocational development, uh, self-esteem, the types of relationship skills and, and capital that Michael talked about. Uh, it's going to be hard for people to change. But right now, we're actually presenting with the federal government at the Reopening of Schools Summit talking about our solutions. And we're hopeful that the new administration will embrace some new ideas about how we hold schools accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim, I'm going to go to you with the next question, um, which says that, um, you know, it sounds like uh, your programs require a big commitment from Optimax, uh, both in terms of, of time and money. And, and I wonder, Michael, if you might also address this, that these, these programs require significant commitments from employers. I wonder if, if both of you could address a little bit of how, how do you or would you convince other employers that, that they should do what the employers, uh, your employer partners are doing, or Jim, in your case, what you're doing? Yeah. That, that is a good observation. Uh, it, it does. And I'm fortunate enough to work for uh, a management team that really recognized the importance of this work. So uh, it's been my role for the last 15 years or so. Um, in, in our area, we've created the Finger Lakes Advanced Manufacturers Enterprise, and that is a consortium of employers. And one of the things that we do there is try and share some of these best practices and see, you know, make it easier for a smaller company to piggy piggyback on to uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a strong commitment and it's a challenge for uh, for some employers. That's a that's a real thing. Um, but um, again, it's just I, I, I owe it. We owe it all to uh, our, our founders that started the company 30 years ago. <laughs> No, I, th I think it's a great observation and a great point, but I think it's also in just how you frame it, right? Colleges and universities jobs are providing incredible workforce talent to the workforce, right? And so why shouldn't the workforce be involved in the cultivating and grooming of that talent? So it's, it's very self-serving, you know, early on in our initiative, we were dealing with employers that just didn't get it, right? For whatever reason, they only saw it as corporate charity. And what was amazing was we opened up a second campus in Plano, Texas. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with Plano, Texas, it's a suburb of Dallas, but it's this incredibly progressive environment for business. And it's attracting companies from all over the world to form headquarters there. 
And when we approached the companies out there about this project, about this program, they all understood exactly what it was. It was access to talent at a cheaper price point than what you would spend when you go through a typical recruiting cycle, hire someone, and then hope that it works out, right? What we're offering you is almost a freebie look. I mean, because, you know, you're either going to pay $10,000 for two semesters of a student's time or $15,000, which is still peanuts compared to what these companies are spending in training, recruitment, retention, and all of that. And it gives you an opportunity to, with our help, to figure out if these students are going to work out for you. Um, so, yes, it involves engaging with the corporate community. I happen to think that we have a responsibility to engage with the corporate community and help and get their perspective in the talent that we're producing for them. So I think everyone wins in this arrangement. And, and to, to your point, Michael, um, you know, it is, it is self-serving. Uh, I remember coming out of a meeting, oh, this was back before, before all the shutdowns happened, um, and we were at a meeting where all these business owners were lamenting that they couldn't find talent. And uh, I walked out of the meeting with our HR director and myself, and I was like, can we say that? And we, we can't, because the work that we do, uh, we were able to hire uh, 95 people in 200 in, in 2019, um, you know, in, in one year and, and have about an 80% retention rate. Um, so, you know, that th this work pays off. So getting other people to recognize that is the key. <clears throat> great. Good, great. All very helpful. And, um, yeah, having that that sort of mindset take hold though in the in in the in the employer community sometimes does feel like it takes some work though. Um, so great to have these examples. And um, a question for all of you, um, and, and answer in whatever you order you'd like. But um, I think in various versions, this question has come is like, how has COVID affected all of this? And so particularly, um, but but for all of you, yeah, I mean, what what is is has there been? Jim, you mentioned that being able to reach a lot more students, which is sort of an unexpected benefit. But I'm just wondering, have there been unexpected benefits? Have there been sort of you know real challenges um, by the pandemic, and 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 what have been the lessons from that? Well, our, our I'll, I'll take some of that. Our our hiring has slowed down uh, over the past year, so we've kind of just been uh, we're up around 400, and you know through attrition, uh, we haven't had to lay anyone off or shut down or anything like that we've been able to work throughout the pandemic but we've had very limited access to our facilities so a lot of the job shadows and tours and things that we've done are just off the table um we're we're back at a point right now where through these presentations which we've just started doing over the last month or so uh we're we're back to having a ton of candidates uh that are interested in job shadows and internships this summer so we're having the discussion this week about how much of that we're going to be able to accommodate this year and what we want to work is very good uh our, our business is very strong and our bookings are tremendous and we need to start hiring some more people so uh, we're going to be finding ourselves switching it back into that mode uh pretty pretty promptly here yeah i think for for us it's undeniable that the corporate work program aspect of our college has been changed. Um, and in part, I mean, we went virtual. We went, when we went virtual in March, we did so knowing, or let me say this, really expecting that we would maintain virtual status until August of 2021. Um, and that's, that's what we've seen because we, we didn't think there was any way safely and we, we, I mean, I know others have found a way to survive. Um, we just, for us, we just, the downside of it was so, so scary for such a close-knit community like ours. Um, so we've had virtual internships, but what we've done as an institution, we've then taken the students who would have been in internships and re-enrolled everyone in an intensive year-long training program. Um, because we identified holes that we could frankly improve our performance in and that's been a gift and then from an institutional standpoint we've literally remade the entire institution uh, by the time the students come back in august they will see three brand new buildings that will have been completed they will see that we have partnered with 
a KIPP charter school and Dallas Independent School District to open two new high schools on the campus. Um, we've added our first graduate degrees. Um, we've added a path and jogging trail throughout the college. We've cleared out land to create a forest for the school. We've repaved the roads. We've added an honors college, an urban scholars program. So what we've tried to do is teach students how you make best use of the disruptions in your life and that there are no bad experiences, only what you choose to do with the experiences you have. Amen. I love that question. So when we shut down our schools, we brought our all staff together, uh, 900 plus teachers, 3,000 employees, and said, for the first time in my career, we're called essential. We're essential workers. Teachers made the list. And that means we have to open our schools up for our families so they can go to work and so the economy can continue. And our, our, our staff showed up to provide meal service, to provide instruction and care. And we were the only district in April that was open for our community for those purposes as essential workforce. But looking at the essential workers, our healthcare, infrastructure, Department of Defense, uh, all the different jobs that take care of the community don't necessarily have a straight path to a four-year university. A lot of trades, a lot of internships, yes. a lot of opportunity where kids can learn on the job and maybe go get a degree later once they decide, well, I like development, but I want to be an architect, so I'll go to a four-year school now. And it really changed the conversation around essential workforce and validating that all work has value. There's dignity in all work. Food supply chain, people working at the grocery stores for the first time, thank, thank you for your service. You know, it, it really... It's validating in terms of the work that I think that all three of us are doing in our different environments, but we can't lose sight of, of this post COVID in terms of how we deem the value and dignity of work and gainful employment as a means to an end. Three, three quarters of my students are come from um, below the poverty line. And, and this is why we've changed our system so that we can deliver on the investment that they're making with their 12 years of school with us. Well, what a wonderful, uh, beautiful note to end on is how the pandemic has made us see essential workers and, and appreciate essential work in, in ways that sometimes maybe uh, we, you know, um, our conversation from education training don't sh shed enough light. So that is that is really beautiful. And then you know, we are at 2.43. And if I remember correctly, I am going to turn it back over to Megan now. Um, Megan Banta Lewis, am, am I right about that? If not, I can also ask another question, but I thought I... Like, yeah, I can okay. go ahead and ask um, maybe one final question and then sure. we'll turn it over to PJ. Great, already. You would like me to ask that one part? Oh, oh I'd be happy to. Okay, pardon sure, me. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Megan. Yeah, um, going back to our earlier instructions, which I obviously did not, did not uh, pay enough attention to. So yeah, I think as a final question, um, just for all of you, just on, on the way out, you know, we have a new administration. Um, David, you, you addressed specifically some things that you hope the new administration does, but you know, if each of you could identify just sort of one or two sort of policy changes or investments that you think the new administration and the new Congress could make, um, what would you like to see and what do you think would be helpful to you and your students and your employees? I'll start. We're, we're speaking to them right now, and I, our, our mission is to change federal policy around how we measure success. Our vision is happy kids and healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. If we're, successful, if we're successful, we'll have happy adults engaged in healthy relationships, gainfully employed. Gainfully employed people in healthy relationships with healthy self-esteem don't commit crime. They don't do drugs. They, they, they contribute to society. And so a lot of the society, societal problems will be fixed if we start reshaping our systems of education around success in the world. My hope. I love that. Um, I would say double the Pell Grant um, and make sure that the Pell Grant's available year round. Um, the Pell Grant has not kept pace with inflation or the cost of living. The, the Pell Grant, because it hasn't done so, then opens up students to having to work um, in ways that really aren't conducive to, you know, the educational experience in the way that we, we think is important. Um, and it, it reduces an enormous amount of financial pressures on hardworking people 
we're trying to do the right things. You know, there, there's this notion from some people that people who come from under-resourced communities, that somehow their fault and that they don't work hard enough. And that is garbage, right? These, these are folks who work harder and longer than, than most. And, but what it is, is they can't catch up for the things that have happened much longer ago or much ago. And so doubling the Pell gives them the resources to go through school, not rack up $35,000, $40,000 in student loan debt and alleviate some of the stress in their lives. The alleviation of stress absolutely translates into reduced medical bills which is a value to our society as well. So the magic elixir from my standpoint, double the power. And, and for us, I would say, uh, continue the support for apprenticeships. Um, our apprenticeship was started uh, as a, after a nudge by the Obama administration. Uh, we hosted uh, Vice President Biden at the time. And uh, uh, shortly after that, we were tasked with creating our apprenticeship. Um, and, and it's been a really great thing for us. Uh, the Trump administration was positive on apprenticeship as well. And I think that the, the Biden administration seems to be headed in the same direction. So uh, I'd like to see that. And again, making the students aware that the um, that this is a post-secondary education that they should be looking into, or at least weighing out. Great, that's uh, excellent answers, very concrete sort of policy um, um, actions too that I think are very much in the conversation right now. So it's exciting and I think it's gonna be an exciting year. Um, okay, and so with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over to PJ. Um, thank our, uh, our, our panelists who've done just an excellent job. Thank you for this great conversation. And PJ, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Mary Alice, and uh, yes, I definitely echo my thanks to to you, to Jim, uh, Michael, and David for participating in the panel, and to all of you for uh, attending. 